Welcome to the Sitecore Sessions, where Sitecore experts discuss Sitecore. This is episode two, where our panel will discuss generative AI. David Sanfilippo, I am the principal of uh, uh, Proficient Sitecore Practice. Um, I lead us kind of from a go-to-market and I'm really focused heavily on, on Sitecore's new tools, XM Cloud and all their SaaS products. Martin Miles, I am a Sitecore Platform Technology Director here at Proficient. Uh, I'm also involved in all these composable things, especially in XM Cloud, uh, seven times Sitecore MVP. So far, hopefully will be eight next month. Can I go now? Matt go Connolly, Practice Director for the Sitecore team here at Proficient. Uh, background in development, uh, kind of overseeing operations and delivery, and still trying to to keep my my toes in the water as it when it comes to the dev side of things. I'm Drew Taylor. I'm a developer here at Proficient, and I specialized in front end frameworks, and now I'm jumping headfirst into everything AI, including some of the XM Cloud stuff. It's really fun too. All right, so so thanks everybody for joining. Uh, I really wanted to talk about generative AI. I hear about it all the time, uh, a lot of buzz of it, especially in the Sitecore community. I know Matt earlier today you you had a, a new blog post. Um, uh, what was it? The Wizards of I can't remember. The new the new Wizards. The uh, new Wizards. One hundred X development in the age of generative AI. Um, yeah, it's something that's kind of stuck with me. Uh, reading some some great science fiction with uh, Ursula Le Guin last year, um, thinking about kind of how the, the wizards work in that world where their power comes from the ability to, you know, to speak the right incantations, but kind of weave their magic in and out of, of nature. And, you know, they're not all powerful, right? But by using the words, they're able to get kind of what they need to, to happen. And, you know, I, I, I've been going back to that kind of analogy when I've been working with generative AI. So I've gotten to be part of some some pilot groups here at Proficient, um, uh, notably with with GitHub Copilot. And, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of that same feeling where it does seem like saying the right thing, an incantation, if you will, to, to get the result that you want um, does take some skill, right? I'm 0% worried that developers are going to be uh, completely made, you know, redundant, and that the, the marketers will be able to create everything on their own. There's still going to be a need to write code. The, you know, copilot's not there yet. It may be in our lifetimes, but I don't feel like this this current generation is going to get quite there. But being able to ask the question and understand what needs to be asked, shape the question. And very importantly, be able to read the answer and know, was this like a well-answered question? Did it actually understand the context? Is what it gave me correct? Because a lot of times it is, right? I mean, that's that's been my experience is that most of the time it does a pretty good job. Sometimes it needs a little bit of tweak back and forth. Sometimes it is gibberish. It is completely wrong. But you have to be able to know and be able to look at that answer and understand the answer in order to be able to to handle that. So great power comes great responsibility, et cetera. You know, can throw different metaphors at it. But I do see it making developers that know how to use AI significantly more productive, right? Instead of taking a team of people, it might take just a couple, right? Being able to build out, you know, a component every, you know, several components a day based on the design. Who knows how much of this is going to get automated at the end of the day? But um, I do see the need for the people that know how to use these tools, and that's not a skill that's going to be be easily replaced. So the value of a wizard to a village, they can do a lot with with just a few spoken words. And I do see that being the role of, of developers in the future. Yeah, I mean, the 80-20 principle, right? I think it really helps a lot with the 80% of what is really plumbing right getting getting stuff the, the just the basic structure of things of classes of, of components uh so you can really focus on the business logic and the stuff that's not going to easily be able to generate but even if it gets you a, a little way there it, it's it, it's worth 
integrating into your development flows? I was involved into GitHub Copilot pilot, uh, yeah, <laughs> double pilot. Thank you. Yes. Pilot program, and uh, my first emotion about it was a exceptional wow effect. Uh, the reason to it was I made a pretty uh, exact prompt what I wanted it to do. It was something like, I want you to generate this specific component that works with Net.js, but I want it to be with a tailwind, styled with tail tailwind with specific uh, color palette. I also wanted to use uh, TypeScript, so please generate it to me. And it ended up generating me the entire folder of the files. There was uh, config for Tailwind, config for TypeScript, like everything, like all the configs, everything, components were. And I was thinking, oh my God, like it it, it, it did the entire work for me, like entire folder for Next.js. So when I start digging deeper, I start realizing not everything is that roses and, roses and sunshine on this uh, side of things. So lots of things I have to complete after it. And I also had some questions about the uh, chat side of uh, Copilot. So it was not always given me that what I was looking for. But in general, it was very much uh, exciting to see what it generated. And other things that I have a big call to all these AI tools is as a developer, I see lots of my time wasted for non-productive things. So let's say I have a Visual Studio code on my huge monitor, vertical monitor, like imagine it, it's it's a lot, but I still have lots of folders with my mono repository. Plenty of time is just spent for navigating between these folders, finding right things, or just repeating the same uh, code generating activities or maybe copy pasting activities which basically should be coming in a, is in a matter of second like i want to, to to either press a hotkey or type something but very quickly and required stuff appears in the required directory so it should be taken out of the context somehow automatically that's my call for ai at least for the beginning well one thing i'll note i mean it's not as it's not as precise that you have to get the the exact um, spell correct on the first try, right? Having the exact words, because a lot of times you do it and then you see what it produces isn't exactly what you want, but it's like a session. It's like a, a conversation. You can continue to to introspect it and ask it to refine and, and do better. And and that alone helps you get to a better place, not having to to just be it a, be a black box process that either works or doesn't work. It can work in stages where you can continue to refine and improve over time. Just today, I was working with Bitbucket. I had to deploy a Svelte Kit app to the web, and it also had a bunch of Python backends. And I've never worked with any of those three things. And I took the YAML configuration that I'd never seen before and stuck it into Bing Chat and said, "I need to do these things with it." And walk me through what you're going to change. And it said, "Here's what I'm going to change. Here's how I'm going to do it. And here's why." I edited a few things, put it in, and so far as I can tell, that it's it's working. And you know that that was zero background knowledge of how to actually write that deploy pipeline. And now I get to see it working, which is much faster than it probably would have been going through the documentation and all of that. One other connection that I've I've made recently that I I did talk about in my blog post was a shift in how we read code as opposed to writing code. Um, I read a, a, an interesting book last year, The Programmer's Brain by, I think it's pronounced Felina uh, Hermans, where she talks about a lot of the ways that our brain work as it relates to, to software programming. And one of the key concepts that was kind of an aha moment for me at the time, but I've, I've kind of gone back to is that just the concept of reading code and interpreting it is a separate skill from writing code. You know, obviously we think about learning the languages, but the vast majority of our time as developers has typically been on the writing as opposed to the reading. Sure, we're looking at PRs depending on your role, but spending dedicated time to practice the skill of reading code is something that you can do to help improve your ability to read code. 
One really interesting concept I, I like that I, I did mention in the blog post was around the idea of having short term memory versus long term memory when it comes to reading code that when you scan with your eyes a section of code, right? You kind of build a mental model of what you're looking at. If there are parts of it that you know and then are coming from long term memory, essentially your brain, you know, it has kind of a pointer to that piece of information in your long term memory. And so the the parts that are just unique to that section of code you're looking at, you know, take up a little bit less space. So you're able to take in more, understand more quicker if you have more parts of the code that are coming from your longer term memory. So the practical implications are making sure that you're actually learning and memorizing, you know, API calls in the libraries that you're working with. Um, I'm somebody that used to be, you know, very reliant on Google. I knew it was there. I knew I didn't have to memorize those things. I didn't see the value of it, but I think that's something that I would rethink now. Um, I would want to make sure that I do know where those those calls are coming from and that I, I know where they are so that when I'm reading code, it's going to be easier for me to read it. Things like naming conventions, you know, prefixes on variables to make them slightly easier to read. I think it's going to be important for us to be intentional in making that shift to prioritizing readability. I'm sure there are lots of people that have been advocating for that for a while, but it's really going to pay off when we're talking about you know, taking a short prompt and then having it, as you said, Martin, bring back an entire folder structure, right? That's a lot of of reading you're going to have to do to ensure that you got the things that that you needed. So that balance is going to shift. And I think we we do need to be intentional about it. I don't really agree with what you say, uh, but I find it very ironically, Matt, that you see, I agree with uh, reading the code skill, right? But you learn how to read the code by actually writing the code. It sounds uh, contralogical, but that actually how it works, how we build muscle memory. A good example is that when I start learning uh, React Next.js after being a very decent .NET developer, uh, I was reading a lot of code, but once I sit at the keyboard trying to type something, I had issues. You know, like I have lots of brackets, curly brackets, round brackets, square brackets, and uh, when you do all this, uh, JavaScript typical scenario of writing code where you have lots of brackets. Um, you don't pay attention to it when, once you read, but once you write the code and you fix it manually a couple of times, you start uh, understanding these patterns. Um, a very good example of that was uh, somewhere in React. I probably can't get off my mind, but uh, or it was TypeScript, the difference between square brackets and uh, Curly uh, was doing the totally opposite meaning to what you declare. And again, once you read it without writing first, you don't even pay attention to it. So that makes me a little bit worried because once you start uh, relying on the code generated by AI and you should just start taking it and placing it into your repository, then you don't pay attention to it and you may be much poor reader of the code for the future. So once you're reviewing a pull request, you may probably just miss out that small nuances of brackets or whatever. It was just an example. It could be different things. I, I wonder if this is going to make us have less people who really know, know the code base because some of it's being generated and you don't know it as intimately as you, you may have known it in the past. Like I recall past code bases that I knew so well that if something went wrong, I can kind of think through my head the possible places where things could go wrong and investigate them and get to the, the answers very quickly. I think if we're generating a lot of that code, um, well, one, it may not have the, the, the minor issues that that come from logic issues uh, because it may be better at, do, at, at creating that code, but it may take longer to troubleshoot an issue because no one really knows it at that level anymore problem potentially can be solved and you know I don't know how you run the analysis on which one's more valuable whether is one guy that can solve the problem in five minutes better or four guys that can solve it in 30 I'm not sure but at we're getting AI systems that can start to look through the entire code base and if you ask it a question it can bring up say the 10 most relevant files and they could do that on any scale of project and that's the kind of thing that 
if you're a reasonably skilled developer at any level of problem triage, you know, the 10 most relevant files, you'll get to the bottom of it somewhat quickly. Whether or not you could have figured out those 10 files at all, if you hadn't had the AI, I think is an open question. And without a developer who'd previously known about it, might have taken you forever. And I think that that may help solve that issue where people aren't paying as close attention because AI is what's primarily writing the code. They put the PR up because it visually looks like what they want, their test case is passed, and then a bug shows up and they don't realize it's their code because they didn't really write it, but they just come full circle, ask the AI, it points to that code and they go, oh, I see why that might've happened. And so I almost think it solves itself. There is another side uh, issue that can, basically it's the entire separate Pandora box when dealing with AI is the copyright uh, uh, issues, all this copyright infringement and other things. So the good the good thing about it is that Microsoft say they will cover you if you are in trouble by using their AI tools. So whichever lawsuit comes, but Microsoft will handle it for you. That's at least is a promise. And another good thing is that I remember there was a lawsuit by Oracle about some Java line of code lines of code, it was API, and someone tried to sue another company for, for using this API, which was clearly insane call, and luckily the good side won this lawsuit. But there still might be different, different uh, level of depths on, okay, how, how, how deep can you borrow someone's code? Uh, Microsoft tells that they train their systems only on open source code, but there were issues previously when it was not the case. So you may still have some leftovers. And we should be very much cautious about what is the region of the code. Anyway, when something is being generated, I'd like to see the regions. I'd like to see the references. That's my call. Yeah, organizations are still coming out with their policies on how to do that. I think Proficient has been trying to figure that out themselves. Um, and then that's part of why they had that co-pilot for, for, for GitHub co-pilot. That pilot for go, did I say that right? I might have said that wrong. The co-pilot pilot. The pilot for co-pilot. <laughs> Not the co-pilot for co-pilot. That didn't make any sense. Um, I, I do want to talk about copyright, but then, then we start getting into content marketing, which I do want to cover. But before we move off a of kind of the development topic, how do you see it evolving from a Sitecore perspective? There are some good things I noticed uh, with usage, use cases. Uh, let's say we have a component builder, uh, the one that comes with XM Cloud. So, you know, like you can visually draw some components. Uh, you can even br bring your own components, which was recently introduced. In any case, you end up with some sort of component you create. You can publish it to Experience Edge. And my Previous call was, okay, I have this component, but until I get it in some sort of serialized, I do not owe it. So what if I want to migrate it somewhere else? What if I want to do whatever I want, source control that? And that feature, I, I spotted out that feature recently. So I saw the code that basically does serialization and deserialization of these components. So far, so good. So I open up the code, which was serialized. It was quite messy, but you see the idea here that since it's been serialized and deserialized, there's the rules behind of this code. Uh, it's messy. I don't even want to go in depth and understand what the rules are. I better create 10 components, maybe 20 components, describe them verbally, and take this serialized output, put it into the AI, and say, OK, this, 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 this is a description of component. It produces this code. This is another component. So find the common patterns, find all the things. So basically, I will train my AI to generate this serialization for the components, meaning that I can generate the components simply by typing the prompt. I didn't so even that, think about generative AI from an XM Cloud Components perspective. That leads to some interesting use cases. And I think of other tools like, I don't know, have you guys looked at V0 from Vercel? It, it gives you the ability to describe the kind of component you want to build, and it'll then build out a React uh, component with Tailwind that that looks like whatever you describe. So I could imagine kind of connecting that technology with XM Cloud Components to give marketers a way to kind of go from nothing to describing what they want and having something that they can customize in the cloud builder. I think yeah, the progress. 
I think the progress we've seen recently with what's coming out of OpenAI with ChatGPT building custom GPTs, I feel like this is going to be what we're seeing over the next year, right? Where we go from these, uh, you know, LLMs that have a kind of a fixed code base, right? They've been trained on a bunch of open source code, but how can I have it read in, you know, all of the Sitecore documentation? right or all of our own repo how can i make sure it's got all of that context to be able to give me a better answer and that is a problem that's being solved through advancements in the tooling you know right now and with with each different version that's coming out so it does feel like right now the the move that Sitecore has made to composable and you know we're doing a lot more writing of javascript and you know react and nextjs so it, the, the timing has been good there's not a lot of proprietary c sharp libraries that we're we're hitting and you know most of our work is is somewhat agnostic of of sitecore um but you know i think that is also a problem that's still going to be solved sooner rather than later to be able to give us all of the context we need for those very specific answers I want to give you an example of how I am actually solving this, what you might just said for my organization. So a very good example. We have a uh, site called Slack where individuals communicate. There's lots of problems. People come there, discuss, uh, find the solutions. The problem with site called Slack is that until recent, no one ever bothered sponsoring it. I don't remember the exact reason, but site called denied doing that. So we ended up having all the charts kept only for three months and no longer. Uh, I am what I'm doing on my own. I am going and extracting every single information from Sitecore Slack uh, over the course of three months. So I do it like once in two months just to take whatever I can take out of it. But Slack was <laughs> done in speci specifically in such manner to make this process as much difficult for you as possible. So they don't do, they don't give you ability to generate things. They don't give you ability to uh, manage export it in, PD in P to PDF. Even if you select stuff and copy paste, they uh, distort styles. They remove images. So it's it's very difficult manual work for you to do. But you can still do that. So I go into web version of it and I try to somehow copy still manual work, a lot of manual work. Sometimes I spend days just to prevent data from the channels I'm only interested in. That's headless, that's uh, Next.js stuff again within headless. There's example out of course and a couple others. So what I do with this information, I throw it into Evernote. With time, my Evernote grew significantly. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to build a custom GPT, throw all that information into it and give access to the people within the organization so that basically there was lots of valuable information for at least past year and you can uh, get it all as a part of train context so that we all benefit from it. That's my uh, hackathon exercise for this month. <laughs> and I, I hope to give positive notes on that. That is one of example, but it could, I, it could be anything. I wonder how, how good it's going to be, because it's kind of hard to tell what's correct and what's just they're asking a question and incorrect. It's not like, uh, especially with chat transcripts like this. But this is something I've been thinking about a lot in, in some of the POCs I've built. Um, yeah, you can probably get a lot of, uh, uh, data and documentation and upload it so your GPT model knows about it and, and, and can use that in the responses. But if you want to ask a, a question or talk about your site, for instance, there's no real good ways of letting GPT know about it, right? If you think about the size of the data, all the fields, um, the versions, um, all the rendering details, um, it's so di it's it's not only large, it's very dynamic. So like even if you out export it and try to upload it in a format your model could understand, it immediately be, be be stale. So so you'd have to think about uh, keeping it up to date and 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 it's just not something that's going to work. Now when that's, you do good. That was one of the things that I thought potentially Sitecore could look into doing, and I don't know if they will, but. You can, if you if you train a model on data, if you sort of fine tune it, then the amount of data that you can then use is far greater than what you could front as context. So you could theoretically get your 
minimum viable product for production, whatever you, you first ship out. And then maybe you could establish a six month cycle or something where you fine tune the model on the entire site core context. So the whole tree and the running parameters and the fields, and it's actually going to have this general knowledge. Then you in, you integrate that with like a rag style search, and then it's able to, with some degree of accuracy, pull out the most applicable templates, the most applicable things for some search you execute. And it'd be way more accurate than if you just tried to give it, a, I mean, your demo was pretty solid and it wouldn't have nearly the level of power that something like that would have. Absolutely. I, I mean, every six months, like how, how up to date is your content going to be or your data going to be? That's the the problem with it. It's not something you can run even every hour, right, to, to, to keep it up to date. So, I mean, you were talking about the demo. The approach I took was let's provide that context in the moment. So if we're right clicking an item, uh, we can feed GPT. Uh, all the fields, all the values, the, the 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 linked presentation details and their values, and use that to ask like for keywords. Or the other thing I wanted to do is to use it to generate code. So go to a rendering, uh, right click and start this prompt, and provide it with uh, all the fields on the data source templates that's, att that's attached to it. The rendering parameters. If it's a view rendering, go to that CSHTML file and read it in. If it's a controller rendering decompile it and, 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 and give that decompiled source to it so it knows everything it needs to, to, to do, uh, and then ask it to, to, to generate a TypeScript class, uh, excuse me, a TypeScript component, right? Um, and I'm, I'm kind of at the point where it's doing it, but the quality is not great, so I need to, to provide some data to train it so it knows what a good site core component looks like. Uh, and that's going to take some time to put together because to do it kind of at the minimum, they want 10 good examples, but they really recommend 50. Uh, and I don't know that I have 50 good examples of, of, of TypeScript components yet that, that I could use that are not proprietary to a client. Yes, question to the audience. Uh, let's rewind back 10 years ago where test-driven development was a solid practice. Could you name the top reason why people did not write the tests? Why hard didn't to keep, they? Were they hard to keep? up to date that's one of the biggest yes and they also were a little bit lazy uh, i think both of that could be very much resolved by using of ai so i recently introduced two new things into a uh, static kit i'm building for next.js headless uh, applications and one of them is a storybook that allows you to develop um, your Next.js components in total isolation, being entirely agnostic from Sitecore, which saves a lot of time. The second is end-to-end uh, -end testing with Cypress. So what I noticed is that using AI simplifies writing the cases and tests for both of them significantly. More to say, it's exactly what UDSF said. It can be addressed to keep the test in the actual state. So once you see the test fails, you immediately spot out which exactly test fails and say this test fails because of that. Look up the code, compare that, and it basically can give you prompts how to update or update it automatically. I did not try that, but I think that is a pretty valid use case. Yeah, so, test generation makes a lot of sense. Something I really liked about your POC uh, DSF was I feel like a lot of what I've seen in the DXP space has been very marketer oriented, right? It is around content generation, metadata, imagery, things like that. I haven't seen a whole lot on the the coding automation side. So it was nice to see, you know, kind of that that workflow of creating the component, you know, with the context. I, I thought that was that was really good and I immediately started thinking of of other ideas of of how we could enhance this, but um, maybe we could get, uh, what's the name of the, the new uh, Sitecore recipe? Uh, Accelerate. 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 Maybe, we, maybe we could get them to, to build out the, the 50 good examples we need to help, help feed our models. That, uh, I, I will say I have heard a lot of movement towards this more code generation automation. I know uh, back at SoCon, could you kind of share their approach? I've heard of other partners with their own accelerators, I think Agency Q had something, um, but like even looking at the space, right? There's lots of tools that go from like Figma to React or go from HTML to Figma. 
So it feels to me like a lot of the pieces are out there. They just haven't been co completely connected end to end to, to really do everything you want to do. And I think it's a matter of time before everything's connected and, and, and really we can start seeing this vision become a reality. I do think okay, the so I do think the question. end state is uh, is just going to be feeding your style guide and company themes into uh, an AI that will then go generate the website for you. That's that's probably coming at some point. Hopefully not too soon. Oh yeah. Let's shift other side to the future. We, we've been ten years before. Now let's go. Let's say two years ahead, or maybe three years ahead. How would you? feel the ideal development process? How would you see your day-to-day -day workflow as a developer or as architect? It's an open question. I've got well, AR vision goggles on. I'm just doing this and the whole site is just coming together. Like that's... <laughs> <laughs> that Apple vision stuff is impressive though. You right. could just about like spoof a demo and it wouldn't even be far off in, in three years, I think, that you could straight up have a Sitecore dev wearing the, the vision pros just doing that. Yeah, I think it goes back to the 80-20 rule. A lot, a lot of that 80% is going to be taken for granted and, and we'll be able to move a lot quicker and really focus on other aspects of, of the development, on, on the stuff that's really going to be differentiating, on the integrations, on, on the business logic and the business cases, that not just I need this, this carousel on this page to, to, to swipe on mobile correctly, right? That yeah, stuff should yeah. be tape. Everything that's table stakes should be easy. I think it will be definitely 80-20 principle because it, it it's universal. It won't get away from our life where 80 would be a big single button, make it perfect. And you have to fine tune the rest of 20% remaining things. Let's talk a little bit more about um, maybe more on the content side with, with Sitecore. I've noticed uh, Sitecore's already released uh, generative AI integrated into Content Hub and integrated into Sitecore Send. It's a matter of time before it's in XM Cloud. Um, have you guys checked that stuff out? What do you think and, and how do you think it's going to change um, in the future? I think people are still evaluating what their tools are. I know historically, Sitecore has always positioned itself as kind of the hub for content creation. And I think for those customers that are using, you know, Content Hub or the CMP, right? I think there's a lot of advantages there for that end-to-end -end process. I think it'll be interesting to see if the other customers that still kind of have a content creation flow that exists outside of Sitecore, kind of where that that touch point is going to be and and how they they get involved. I know we work with a company called Writer that really helps with it's it's not. It's not just a wrapper around chat GPT, right? It's it's its own thing. And I, I think we're going to see some dust settle and some some leaders come to play with things like that. I feel like a lot of what I've seen today is it's how do I integrate, get inline access to to chat GPT in the context of my text box. And don't get me wrong, it's great. It's way better than just the blank text box, but kind of rethinking flows and stepping back from that, you know, how do I go from prompt to text and, and going back to a higher level, I think is going to be important. I do think we'll see tools like Writer or, you know, OpenAI certainly has a lot of potential to to keep coming up with, with more tooling, but I think we're going to see that content creation process go to another level, um, being able to spit out all of the necessary JSON and, and drop it into whatever site is is almost like a you know a simple transformation for the LLM, right? Being able to look at source material, manipulate it into a specific provided context, that's what they do really really well. And so having your source material be whatever you want, and your destination be, you know, mobile device or web or kiosk or what have you, I feel like that automation is going to be be covered and handled as well. Not not just writing that original source text. That's I a very think, valid point, Matt. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the key point here is speed of adoption by the audience. So I spent half of a day today in Content Hub without even realizing there is AI. So thanks for telling me that. I'll <laughs> now give it and test it, but without knowing that, I wouldn't even go ahead for, with it. Well, it it's there kind of 
in in the moment, I think it's a step up over the text box, right? But I think like even Swipe or Sin, right? Right now you can you can ask it to write some of the text boxes, the subject lines and things like that. It's not at the point where you could say, go design me an email newsletter that looks like this and it'll select the right template uh, from its collection of templates. It's it's not at that point yet, but I'm sure that that's in the future. I'm very interested to see where the future goes of sort of handing the AI more reins or ha having options to potentially hand it more reins as far as what it can create. Because one of the biggest issues, at least with creating custom GPTs and calling APIs is when it hallucinates. If it's giving you some code and it hallucinates a variable, it's not a huge deal. I mean, you kind of run it, it's whatever. But if it's supposed to call an API and it just hallucinates one of your endpoints, it straight up fails. I mean, that could completely end whatever it was working on if you tried to have it generate content. And I'm very interested to see, especially between Anthropic and OpenAI, they have two somewhat fundamentally different approaches Anthropics being constitutional based, which they argue is long term a much better solution for eliminating hallucinations. And I'm not sure, but I feel like that that's going to be key in seeing adoption at an enterprise level with it plugging into things like helping you generate websites, generating all this stuff, because the less it hallucinates the hard creation elements you tried to give it, the more useful it's going to be and the less expensive because you could just run it again, but then you're getting dinged. That, that stuff is going to be really important, especially if you're trying to use it for personalization. I think there's a big use case there as you get into nitty gritty segmentation and you want to generate content to target a specific use case or a specific type of customer, uh, having, not having to have someone custom write that and use generative value to do that. But the, the hallucinations give someone pause because do you trust it? Do you trust it to, to, to cre create that custom messaging and not offend a customer? I mean, that that's kind of the next step is getting to the point where, where you have that level of trust to, to just run with it. You mentioned Anthro, uh, I'm not Anthropic. familiar with Anthropic. Anthropic Can releases, they're, they're behind the bot called Claude. I don't know if that name is more familiar or not. They're probably, well, Google just came out with their Gemini, so now they're back in the scene. But before that, they were basically the next, the next heavy hitter in the ring. And they're, they're behind Cody mainly. Cody can now access a lot of different AI toolings. You can plug it into GPT-4 and other things, but. I mean, just the growth in this space is incredible, I'm sure. Um, besides just seeing a lot of innovation, I wonder if we'll see consolidation in the market. Amazon um, backs um, Anthropic. So that's the other sort of like Amazon, know. Microsoft, Google. I think one thing that we are starting to see a little bit is some of the big players really got leapfrogged by by what happened with with open ai coming out right google amazon they've, they've been working on their own you know internal stuff for for years and open AI, open ai dropped this and microsoft saw some early demos and they said okay this is what we do we're going to invest in it and rather than try to beat it like we're, we're going to take over if we can um, and I think a lot of these big companies, the big players are tossing out what they have. They're starting over with, you know, what's out there in terms of the, the open source models for large language models and realizing this is way better than where they were going to get anytime soon. So there is a little bit of catch up there, but I feel like they're all going to be pretty close to having something comparable quite soon. Um, the problem right now is everything is evolving so quickly, right? So it's difficult to say, well, just pick the right tool and then learn that tool, right? Because the tools and what they are, what they're capable of are still changing all the time. So it's difficult for us to, to put it into practice while it's evolving so, so fast. And, and it'd be one thing if it was just text content that we're talking about, but we're seeing just as much innovation with, with image generation, even voice generation. Uh, I don't know if you noticed uh, in, in the episode, um, the announcer is a completely generated AI uh, generated voice uh, from Eleven yes. Labs, which is a startup in the space. And they're doing the same thing with, with voices. I could have made it sound like anything. And it sounds so natural. It's very cool. Very cool. The, and the opening track, it's a, it's a bop, as the kids would say. So it's not about... 
It's not about uh, learning these tools because they evolve and they totally switch rather than investing yourself and boosting your own soft skills, such as namely fast learn, fast, uh, not fast learning, but fast adoption is one of the more the biggest skills I can boost in myself today uh, and critical thinking, like th thinking how you can play all these parts together. This is much more valuable these days rather than practical experience with each particular technology. Yeah, but the, some of the image generation stuff is so impressive. It's like so it's hard, getting harder and harder to tell what's real and what's not real. Uh, like even some of the the uh, like the generative fill stuff in in Photoshop, it's just like like what it's able to do. It's just hard to fathom that this stuff was possible. Yeah, but this brings other issues. So there was uh, a recent strike not far from where I live here in California. Uh, the movie actors they were on strike because the uh, film producers, they had a copyright over their image and they decided to digitalize these guys. And uh, now since they have a three dimensional image of the person, they could just generate them by, by, by them own because the rights to that imagery belongs to the film producers, not to the individual. And what, what I found even funnier, there was uh, a recent strike in the uh, adult industry where they <laughs> also people start realizing that this type of content is generated even easier than the movies with the actors who have big names and it, it affects all industries I just gave two examples we are dealing with healthcare so imagine what happens where, where AI hit the healthcare we get unbelievable unprecedented benefits where I remember that was uh, recently there was some sort of uh, medicine was just found out by AI entirely based on the data that they have so far like a big data analyzed and they identified new medicine and way of treating new issues so that is progressive but what to say about the risks healthcare is very sensitive area and we know that yeah well, i do yeah. want to add um you know a, a number of years ago at, at psychor symposium i listened to uh, a very inspirational talk from um i forget the woman's name but she was uh head of like machine learning at mit and she came in to help consult with with NASCAR. And I've, I've used this this story a few times, but they they did analysis on the right time to change tires, right? In terms of the factors in a race, like where what the weather is, you know, track conditions, the specific track, you know, the conditions of the car, et cetera. They were able to build a model, right? Using machine learning that was better at suggesting when they should pit the cars and change the tires than anything had been done before. Um, and those marginal improvements, right? Make make huge impacts on, on the actual race outcomes. The part that was really interesting was the formula itself was, it had just had too many factors that played into it. It wasn't a rubric that could be explained to a human and just taught. It wasn't like it discovered this formula and then you could tell people, here's the formula. It was, you can't even understand the formula. You don't know what it's going to, what it's doing behind the scenes. It's looking at 40 different things to come up with the right answer. And its answer is correct, but we're not gonna be able to kind of understand it in our heads. And to me, that's that goes with a lot of this, right? There is a level of acceptance and trust that you're getting the right answer, and we may not understand all of the factors that went into it. Y'all, y'all heard the uh, the Chinese room theory when it comes to AI. Mm -hmm. It suggests that if you put someone who does not speak Chinese in a room, and you give them some Chinese, and then you give them an inordinately long list of rules of how they should respond. They could take it. We can simplify it for the sake of the argument. Just talk about math. Like you could have a rule that says, hey, if you receive this like two looking thing and then you receive this plus looking thing and then you receive another two, I want you to put four out the window. And the person inside's like, well, I don't know what that means, but I'll do that. And the person who gets four says, oh, it's a calculator. It can solve two plus two. It's like, no, it can't. It just thought it should give four because the rule said so. And there's a lot of people that think that 
AI currently is just a giant Chinese room theory. It hasn't quite figured it out yet. I'd point to image generation as a primary reason that could be the case. It's like, how on earth is it so bad at hands? That just follows. Five fingers, come on. But if it doesn't get it, it's not going to do it. Whereas text, it's a little, it's a little easier to be fooled because it it can get the words right. But you know, I mean, not to get too philosophical, but that's also basically what our brains are, right? <laughs> um, it's just uh, it's just a bunch of rules in there, and we can't explain them. But you know, yeah, yeah. Just get the I, error rate low enough, and then we're there. <laughs> I think I've read stuff about like uploading people's writings who were deceased and then like it could prompt as them. That's kind of, I don't know if it's creepy or, or just very profound, like the implications of that. Going back to what you were talking about, just in terms of, of um, using generative AI with actors. I mean, one of the demos I saw, I'm not even sure who did it was of uh, uh, someone recording someone speaking and have the AI render that same person speaking a different language based on a translation of what they said, but then syncing up the lips so it looks like they're actually speaking the other language. I mean, this stuff is get, is insane how, how good it gets. I, I know what you're talking about. That's actually uh, one of the services already available. You can register. Again, I don't remember its name because there's so many tools uh, today. But what I do, I, I have a note where I track all these tools with a brief description what they can help me with. And that's definitely something you can get straight away today and start speaking Spanish naturally or whichever language you want to speak. Obviously not you, but your avatar. Did you see the rabbit demo? There's some rabbit tools like this uh, electronic device. It had a little rabbit avatar and you can basically talk to it and it will respond with generative AI. And it would enable you, like you can order a pizza, or order an Uber, and stuff like that. I mean, they're like eventually this stuff will all be integrated into our phones, but the the future is going to be wild. I'm curious how big people, if you had to compare this to a previous revolution, how big is the advent or revolution of AI? I think it's big. We have Chat GPT five just at the edge of our doors. It's not yet released, but. Uh, rumors say it will be something un unpretendly powerful. It's that powerful that makes me scary. Again, when when does it pass the point where it can self-generate, self-teach, and do self-analysis, um, entirely self-maintenance? No one knows. Is it a synergy or what kind of point is, is it? We as a human, we remain as a bottleneck, but we remain the only creative part that generates something new because generative AI is based on something that is previously generated. Again, if if it starts taking its own input as uh, it, its own output as an input, uh, who knows where it ends up? The level of hallucination, derivative hallucination, may be way too much. Maybe it will be something ultra creative, <laughs> like a modern art which is not that much art at all in my opinion but some people think it is or maybe it will be some senseless information i don't know i think i think it's bigger than the internet the invention of the internet i think it's comparable to the advent of electricity or maybe planes i don't know bigger than the internet i don't know the internet had to be invented for it to do anything so you could like whether or not the precursor is always bigger, that that's that's an open question. But I think it's bigger because this is the first thing in history that actually allows for non-deterministic acceptable output. Anything before that, even the algorithms that you were talking about, Matt, those you knew what they were going to give you. They were going to tell you about the tires. You couldn't suddenly point it at a human and ask it when it should eat. This is not going to help you. But now we have algorithms where we didn't explicitly teach it either of those things, but it could actually tell us and be reasonably close to correct. And I, that kind of, I mean, it's basically human. It's You created a tiny little human that's not as accurate as you'd like it to be, but that's different than anything else that's come before, no matter how big the technology was, that they always only did a certain thing. I, I do think this is potentially the one of the riskiest 
leaps in technology we've seen. I am a little concerned that humanity just isn't prepared for the implications of this, and we're going to make some missteps. We're going to replace too many jobs before we can figure out how to, you know, use this responsibly. Uh, it does remain to be seen what will happen with some of the legal copyright cases. It may be that the cat's out of the bag and it's too late, but if OpenAI loses a massive lawsuit and says, hey, everything you were trained on, you, you've obviously trained on a lot of things that are copyright and it's not too late. You have to start over. You have to delete everything. You have to retrain again. And it may be that that's probably going to be tough to be walked back and they've got a lot of money and power, so they may not be uh, held accountable in the way that they should, but um, we should not be our first sentence on this. We CR take internet as granted, right? But it can get disappear at one stage. There was a very strong uh, electromagnetic pulse from the sun 150 years ago, so that uh, even telegraphs, which was the mod most modern piece of technology by these days, they were out of the service for uncertain time until they fix it. That strong electromagnetic impulse was. So now imagine we have these small chips uh, with uh, five nm process or smaller that have so so minimal transistors, millions, trillions of them. I don't know how many, and all that is so sensitive to AMP. It, it's uh, such a big risk, and if we become too much dependent on this technology, and it disappears for some reason, for some moment, uh, God God knows what what happens next. It, it's going to be transformative. I don't think there's a way to slow it down or stop it. And any attempts are just going to fail or, or, or delay things by a minor. I think at this point, figuring out the best way to, to use in your workflow so you can be more productive is the way to go. Um, because if you're not going to do it, other people will. 100%. I changed my entire nutrition and diet with these AI help. I just throw everything I'm eating with these stickers. Uh, and this is a big issue for me because I moved from Europe where I have uh, the very good nutrition information. Uh, they measure everything by 100 grams, which means 100%. And I know exact percentage of every piece of nutrition stuff there. While here in the US, they do it maximum, maximum confusingly. They do it per seven so that I think there's much less sugar than it is. So I throw out all this... Uh, uh, nutrition information from all the products I'm eating, whichever I could reach out to to the AI, and at least now I get my diet better, and it it helps by minor steps. It helps and to be to bring us to the better future. So, so I hope everyone is there. So if you gain weight, it's AI's fault for hallucinating nutrition. I'm only yeah. I, I love the advent of AI. I get to blame so many things on it now. I, I've become nothing's my fault anymore. I uh, I hallucinate a pizza last night. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me a very interesting British sketch. Uh, it's called Little Britain, where there was an underskilled person, undertrained, doing a secretary work. And a person comes to that person asking for something. And that secretary was doing typing, typing, typing. Computer says no. And that was the answer. So now we can say AI yeah, says no without even digging deeper. Yep, the answer is 42. There we go. Very deep. That's what OpenAI was working on. Well, we're almost out of time. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the excellent conversation. Thanks. Thanks, DSF. This is great. This was awesome.